my name is Grant Sanju. Uh, I'm director of business development for a company called Playtime. We develop uh, bespoke custom play areas for shopping centers predominantly. Um, so we're, we're a creative company. We do the design, we do the manufacturing, we do the installation. Uh, we've been creating custom themed play areas for about 20 years in the United States. Uh, started with our first project, which is with the Taubman, uh, shopping center Taubman in, in Denver. Uh, we moved on from there. Uh, we work with most of the major developers worldwide that folks in this room are probably familiar with. Um, and so what we've been seeing kind of in our business as well is just kind of as playtime company uh, um, developers know us domestically in the United States, but we're introducing ourselves now to Europe. Uh, so yeah, I'm happy to elaborate more as, as the conversation continues. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jorge. Well, good afternoon. I'm Jorge Ponce Dawson. I'm board director of Broadway Malian. It's an architectural uh, practice based in originally in the UK, now became an international office after 60 years of history. Uh, we have 15 offices around the world. I'm in charge of Spain and Latin America, and I will be give my view by being working on more than 40, 50 projects right now of retail, uh, being refurbished shopping centers, and what are the trends? So I will try to summarize the experience we have now. Great, thank you. Herman. Herman Koch, head of research at uh, Mary Bergman in London, uh, UK-based uh, asset management and investment company managing uh, uh, investment funds uh, with a focus on core cities in Europe, urban mixed use, so we like properties with a mixture of retail, offices, residential, possible other functions, and we do have a participation in the VIA outlet fund, and the total uh, uh, managed value is about 6 billion euros. Great, Sebastian. Thank you, Sebastian Soma. I'm heading the marketing and retail teams of Nainver. Nainver, for those of you who don't know us, we are running 15 outlets across Europe, uh, 24 retail assets, roughly 500,000 square meters uh, under management, um, across six countries, uh, different territories, different DNAs, and different value propositions. And I'm looking forward to having a very intense and uh, exciting discussion with you about future. Okay, great, Marie. Hi, I'm Marie, um, a director in the commercial research team at Savills. If you don't know Savills, we're a global real estate advisor. Now, my particular interest is um, looking at sort of consumer trends, both sort of UK, Europe, and globally, and what that means in terms of retail property. But increasingly, it's not just about retail property, it's about place and the impact those trends are having. So my name is Shane Elstrom. I'm the CEO of a company called Al Farwania Property Developments. Uh, we're based in the Middle East with offices in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Kuwait. And our main focus right now is the development of a $1.2 billion, 2 million square foot shopping center in Abu Dhabi. Great. So you can see there we've got, we've got a range of experiences, um, both European but also global, um, and, and different providers coming from different points. So um, looking for... A, I think it'll be very interesting. I'm going to start with you, actually, Jorge, because I know you've, you've been very bold recently and have been doing research about, which I think is only published in Spanish at the moment, but um, research about retail in 2050, um, which is quite a bold choice. So what, uh, I, I suppose, let's pick up some of the thoughts, some of the key trends that you came up with doing that research. Well, basically, uh, we imagine a society based on internet uh, where the human work is going to be diminishing to a, a grade that we will have more free time than working time. Uh, that free time we will use it to, to go to our entertainment uh, infrastructures uh, that will be not longer shopping centers. I think the evolution is that uh, the shopping center will become in another format, integrated fully in the cities, uh, will be part of the experience of living in a city and will be determined by the Wi-Fi area really. If you have a Wi-Fi area with a common app, uh, with a common management, that could be the shopping center of the future and that could be organized in a park, in a street, in a neighborhood. Uh, it doesn't need to have a specific building. Uh, so that's part of the change we envisage. And I don't know, there are a lot more other ideas but that's probably the summary. Okay, good. Um, and just, just picking up with you, Shane, um, obviously a major, major development 
Um, and what are you doing in terms of that sort of look for entertainment? What, what, are you, what, what are you looking at when you're seeing consumer trends, retailer trends, and how that's playing into the development? Have you gradually had to change some of your thoughts over the process, or, or what's the position? Um, yes, we have. So I think um, the Middle East has always been rather audacious when it comes to how it integrates leisure into the schemes. Uh, we targeted very early on to have an excess of 10%, and looks like we're going to come in around 12% of our GLA dedicated to leisure and entertainment, and uh, a similar, slightly lesser number dedicated to the food. Uh, the food has evolved a lot recently. Um, the Middle East, uh, sort of the food truck revolution, the idea of pop-up food has arrived. And, uh, and we're actually completely redesigning one of our food courts to be a food hall with uh, a certain amount of uh, six-month rotating pop-up uh, food, um, which will invite everybody from uh, Michelin star chefs to come out and offer a limited menu to your grandma who makes the best grilled cheese. And we intend to be there uh, providing all the equipment and some of the expertise and branding, et cetera, for them. Treat it a little bit like uh, a fun experience and, uh, and, and somewhat like a potential incubation space for, uh, for future retailers. But now within the uh, leisure and entertainment, uh, we're, we're actually building a very, very large indoor snow park. Which of course, it's uh, about 46 degrees in the summertime in Abu Dhabi. It'll be minus five in this box. And this is one of the most exciting projects that I've uh, been privileged to be a part of, uh, mainly because we've got a fantastic partner with Majid Al Fatim, who's got 10 years' experience operating Ski Dubai. They're taking that experience to us. This is going to be, uh, you know, what I like about it is that it's actually become uh, a theme park, I mean, uh, sort of an indoor snow theme park with characters and a storybook. And we're talking about making animated videos and trying to get the television to play them and all these wonderful things. So it becomes much more about being transported to a different um, story and it uh, take, goes home with you. Okay, good. And Marie, what are you seeing? Um, you're looking obviously at, at Europe, but I guess you're also getting input from, from colleagues around the world. Um, what are you seeing in terms of that, what we've just talked about there, really, which is creating an experience, creating somewhere to visit, not just about shopping, um, but actually about creating a day out in a way? Yeah, I suppose it's um, moving away from shopping, um, shopping centres as purely a place that you go to shop is actually a place that you go to visit, which might include shopping, but increasingly eating out and leisure. Um, I think that trend is probably a little bit more developed in the shopping centers. I think now we're starting to see that move into high street locations. And I mean, my the thing that I always bang on about now is it's, it's not just about retail. You might have a retail store available, but the end user doesn't have to be a retailer selling a product. So we're seeing brands, for example, move into what were stores as a way to engage with their customers, for example. So they're not there to sell the product, but there to sell the experience. Okay, good. And, and Sebastian, just um, obviously you're, you're looking at the outlet centre and, and you're in charge of marketing and, uh, and you're the retail director for Europe. So what, what are you seeing, I suppose... Um, from the retailer's side, what are they asking you to do? And also, how are you, uh, I suppose, uh, I mean, A, are you seeing new trends from the consumers that are, that are coming into the outlet centers? Um, and, and are you having to adjust what you're doing? I, I saw a, um, uh, an interview where we were talking about uh, an emotional response, that that's what you were seeking from your customers. Um, so. Is that a new direction for you guys, or is that just a development of something that you've been trying to do? Well, I think principally, actually, that um, at least some, or the majority of some outlets, actually have been leading the pack and leading that experience already in the last 10, 15 years. And some have done this fantastically well. So now you see shopping centers picking up, you see some urban or high street districts actually picking this up as well. Uh, but here we have to play a quite, for us, actually, that, that raises the chances of what's next because we actually already pay a lot of attention and experience in 12 times, so what's next? Uh, the second thing is the commercial requirements of retailers um, or the uh, location requirements of retailers are getting more and more strategic, less and less opportunistic. Uh, this has been uh, rather an opportunistic market some 5, 10, even 15 years ago. Um, and why is that happening? Um, and then you look at, and this is one of the main things that we are observing and we probably don't have the solution for that yet, 
but in the outlet, we are actually at the end of the product life cycle of a product. So we are actually hanging on what the brand actually does with their manufacturing and product life cycles. And if they're reducing the leftovers of stock, naturally, the availability for product or made-to-order product for outlet actually reduces too, and the overall footprint of outlet reduces too. So actually, only the best ones are able to survive. So um, given this, more flexibility in leases, higher profit hurdles, bring this to banks, and you know which that kind of, kind of nice discussion we're having right now. So uh, we actually really care about the next five to 10 years uh, because we think that the, uh, that's a consumer that we probably, and the consumer tend we can we can manage. Uh, we are investing heavily into digital just to make sure we are on our feet, that we are heavy, that we are, that we are quick, uh, but uh, don't come to ask, ask us about what's happening in 20 years from now, uh, because uh, that's something I'm not even willing to look at it right now. Okay, I'm going to come to you in a second, Herman. But Grant, I just wanted to pick up with you because we were talking about experience there um, and learning a little bit about what was, you know, what's been happening in in the Middle East and also here. Um, you're obviously based in the U.S., but are um, the international director there? Correct. Yeah. So, so what are you seeing in terms of? the US and how does, I guess, Europe and Asia compare with that? Um, what are the trends that, that you're seeing there um, within your business and within the, the retail industry? Well, we've been uh, creating family destinations for 20 years. So uh, we've been seeing this trend. Uh, it's an ongoing trend where malls are trying to create more engagement with their customers, uh, more excitement. And um, again, we started our first play area in 1998 with a mall developer that needed to activate parts of the mall. There was not enough footfall, dwell time, attendance, uh, consumer spending in the mall, et cetera. Uh, but we've seen, especially I would say in the last 18 months or so, a really a doubling down by some of the big developers back into the family experience and to creating destination attractions for, uh, for, for young families. So we're really good at understanding who our customers are. It's the, 20, the young family, the 25 to 35 year old female, you know, prime spending demographic. Uh, we're creating more dwell time. Uh, obviously, we're, we're increasing shopping center attendance and ultimately more spending in the mall. So we've got 20 years of data to kind of back up what it is that we do. We really understand this business. Uh, so domestically, we've seen a big uptick. I think in Europe, we're still new to the market. So I think Historically, there's been kind of an under under um, under investment probably in, in the family experience in play in general. Um, but I think we're seeing at least in the last 18 months or so a considerable up uptick in terms of just interest and demand. Uh, so we think that the trend in Europe is kind of following what we what we see in the United States. Uh, Asia is still kind of a little bit of a of a different type of a, a situation there because you still have developers that are looking for operators, et cetera, rather than investing by themselves into quality play experiences. But having talked to multiple developers in, in Asia, and I was just in Kuala Lumpur here last month, uh, these operators that I was told were are typically lost, they represent lost leaders for the mall. And when we come into a, a shopping center, our play area benefits everybody. The entire mall increases the footfall, footfall the dwell time, uh, the shopping center attendance, et cetera. So, Again, families are families pretty much anywhere in the world. Nothing has really changed. And, you know, we, we are seeing a considerable increase, though, in demand domestically. And I think that's going to be refl reflected ultimately internationally. Okay, good. Um, and Herman, obviously, although Maya Bergman have, have developed shopping centers, you're very focused on um, urban locations. Um, and particularly when I look at, uh, at the website and the, the types of development that you've been doing, you're kind of following that urbanization theme, I think, um, and, and also looking at much more uh, mixed-use kind of redevelopment of existing areas. Um, what's driving that? Is that because you see that as a, as a, as a key trend going forward or, or currently? Well, I mean, as Maya Bergman, we believe in retail. Uh, we like retail, uh, but we see retail obviously changing, uh, whether it's uh, online e-commerce, whether it's urbanization, where it's lifestyle changes, mobility. There is a whole constellation of change. Uh, we also like, let's say, for our assets, for our products, we like market volumes, we like market growth. So of course, looking on, on the European map, uh, the focus is very much on there where the growth in, uh, takes place and the volume is. Core cities, large cities, and within those cities, because there's a lot of discussion about retail, there's a lot of panic, a lot of people are saying, well, you know, we have too many locations, et cetera, et cetera. 
we try to tap on the lo locations and the areas where actually retail is dynamic, where retail is changing, or even like, you know, for instance, Cold Drop Yard in London, retail is simply popping up. And what we do see, uh, and that of course connects to all those dynamics, it connects to the idea of walkable cities, urban mixed use, where basically the people are, you know, in, in an urban space, urban lifestyle, mixture of function where things like living, working, meeting people, also consuming, go hand in hand, intermingle with each other, where basically the urban quarters are basically shaped by the convenience of having those mixed uh, together. We think that it fits very well into the urban lifestyle. We think it fits very well in where retail is actually heading to, the experience component, the convenience component. Uh, we also, as a property owner, are very happy with it because, of course, mixed use, that means also in the buildings, in terms of flexibility, in terms of changes, you can play with functions, you can adapt to market conditions. For instance, if an office is not suitable anymore for an office, but it is a good residential space, you can convert to residential. You make, can make turnarounds, you can make shifts, which in general, in a particularly a large-scale monofunctional environment, tend to be more difficult to, to realize. And how much, Jorge, how much of a challenge does that present for you, for you as an architect? I want to pick up also the point that um, Herman said about walkability, livability, um, well-being, health, which are all things that are increasingly becoming part of, when we're talking to investors, um, these are all things that are going into their analysis when they're looking at an attractive city or an attractive investment. Um, how important are those trends for you, and is that being is that being driven by the developers, the investors, uh, your sense of good for the world, or <laughs> what, what's what's your sense of that? I think it's a very clear trend. In the origin, retail went out of the cities, and we found that kind of uh, big malls in the outskirts of cities with a lot of parking on Thursday. I think that's the past. <clears throat> retail is living a, a process of coming back to city center because in the young generations prefer to have a life of proximity based on public transport, on going by walking to work. Um, so retail needs to follow that trend and need to come back to city and integrate into the urban fabric and that's a general revolution for this sector. And we are seeing that uh, mixed use is, is helping that process to happen because to be in the center of town, you need to combine the different uses. So for me, it's a real trend, it's very clear, together with the preference of open space um, and all the other factors we already commented, like the presence of more and more leisure, more and more food and beverage offer. But it's a, it's a change of kind of life, I think. It's a, it's a life more human, more, more, more uh, less um, movements from one point to the city to the other. We, I don't know, uh, in the past, people was commuting two hours to go to work. That's uh, abandoned by the new generations. They want to live in center of towns and uh, to have a proximity life. And retail has to follow that. Okay, good. Um, Marie, I, I wanted, to, wanted to pick up with you on some of the ideas about retail being dead and about that there's all of this, this kind of thing. I was looking back um, last night, I did a quick look at what happened when Selfridges opened, which was in 1909, I think, 1906. Um, and it was bringing American service, you'll be glad to hear, Grant, was, the, was part of that. Um, bringing American service, opening it up to everybody, so large windows so that you could see everything. For the first time, you could touch the goods, because before they were all behind glass and you weren't allowed to go near them. So you could go, you could experience it. Um, and it was being called total retail, total shopping. That's what it was being called, and a total experience. So people went there for the experience. They came from all over to go and see Selfridges. Harrods then put a golf course um, on its top floor, for example, things like that that I had no idea. How many of these things are things that are repeating themselves, that have been done 100 years to make a change, um, and actually we're, we're going through a cycle. Like I'm, I'm always amazed that everybody's surprised about logistics when in 1910 it was all done by deliveries um, with boys on bikes. And we used to have, in Victorian times in London, there used to be, I think it was 18 post, posts per day 
were sent out because there was no email, obviously, at that point. Um, so how much of this do you think is, is just a problem that the markets are seeing and it's just a question of evolution? What's your thought on that? Oh, that's a difficult question. Difficult for, the, <laughs> diff difficult for this time, I accept, but... <laughs> I, th I, I totally agree. I think, you know, the irony is nothing is that new. And, you know, going back to the original question, you know, the death of retail. I mean, obviously, you know, we are going to have fewer stores. Retailers don't need as many stores as they might have done 20 years ago. This isn't a new trend. You know, I'm an analyst. I, I, I love data. Uh, if you look at the number of stores that existed just in the UK in 1961, by 2001, it already halved. So this was before the real growth in online. So what we're seeing now is a continuation of a trend that we have been seeing for 100 years. It's just the rate of change is being accelerated by a number of um, different factors. Um, so, you know, going back to the point in terms of livability, you know, 100 years ago, we were very much focused on city centers, um, there was a greater focus on convenience, hence the delivery boys on, on bikes. So I think we're seeing a re return to that convenience. Um, and as a result, we're seeing occupiers move out from, you know, out-of-town retail parks like IKEA, for example, because the consumer, and we have to remember the consumer, and particularly, I know someone's going to hate me for saying, you know, millennials. You know, if you look at city centres and in terms of car ownership amongst millennials, it is declining they're not going to be driving out to Ikea out of town. And as a result, retailers are you know, wanting to be closer to their consumers. Obviously, different geographies, it, it's different. But in the case of UK and Europe, that you know, they are really going to be driving the agenda. Yeah, and I suppose as well, um, Shane, when um, obviously you're building in a place where it's extraordinarily hot, uh, like for people who are building things in Iceland, where it's very cold. So therefore, having a large shopping center is a destination in itself and a relief from the outside. So um, it's probably very different in terms of the availability of um, High Street, for example, as a different thing. Um, are you seeing different types of formats coming through from the retailers. I mean, Marie just mentioned their IKEA, which has just opened a couple of stores, one in Madrid and I think one in, po in Poland, actually. And, London now. and in London, and as, London. as well. Um, where they're small, deliberately urban, small shops. Um, are you seeing different formats coming through um, in, in terms of the, the, the sort of retailers who are, who are looking at, at your spaces? Well, to pick up on your heat comment, you're absolutely correct. Um, in fact, I would uh, argue if you, if you come to the Middle East, um, you'll see that our shopping centers are extremely large. Uh, we have shopping centers. Two million square feet is not considered to be massive. Uh, there's actually two that are larger in Abu Dhabi, um, way outside of the city center. There's one in Dubai that's over four million square feet. But uh, so what tends to happen, you're right, we don't have the high street. So the high street is actually replaced by these massive air-conditioned shopping centers, which become full day out experiences. So as we mentioned, they've always had a heavy leisure. The food, um, if I'm honest, was, was not very well done until recently. The newer shopping centers, including the Dubai Mall, have phenomenal food offers. And of course, we typically anchor them with a hypermarket, which is a little bit unconventional uh, in some of the European centers that would have a, a pure fashion focus kind of situation. As far as um, the retailer is concerned, um, I don't want, <laughs> the reality is that IKEA is shopping around um, in the region for IKEA urban locations and uh, we're obviously extremely keen on those kind of opportunities as they come up inside of these, uh, these shopping centers. But predominantly, the Middle East is uh, legs a little bit behind in terms of the uh, retail innovation. Okay, good. Um, Grant, just coming to you, I, I wanted to pick up on um, some of the points here, but also just changes that you're seeing. Um, so have you seen a change in demand um, in terms of what people are looking for, the shopping centre owners, as a reflection of what consumers are looking for. Um, are you seeing any identifiable trends um, from your side? Well, I think it's uh, everything we do is bespoke, it's custom. Uh, we're seeing, I guess, a double down on uh, requirements or requests for malls, for example, to bring their brands into the play area. So our players should reflect, obviously, the, the developer's brand, uh, the family engagement program, if, if there is one. 
you know, also, we historically have been very, very uh, strong in the area of, of the design, supply, uh, installation of play areas for, for young families and, and kids seven years and younger. What we're seeing now is that they're looking, uh, customers are looking for a complete family engagement uh, experience. So expanding the demographic, let's say up to 10 to 12 years, for example, so that for us represents some additional opportunities to create more complex, larger type structures, uh, I guess even more dynamic types of family, uh, family attractions. So, I mean, we've just opened a couple of substantial uh, play areas this year, uh, one in the Mall of America, which is a ticketed attraction. Uh, actually, end of last year, uh, a big Westfield property in New Jersey, uh, which has got a virtual aquarium in it. It's got a climbing net system, so uh, very, very extravagant. Uh, and these are all offered, by the way, as, a, as an amenity to customers in the mall because the mall understands that the more customers we bring in, the longer they're going to stay, the more they're going to spend. So at least domestically, and, and what's interesting, too, with that Westfield project, by the way, is Amazon came in as a sponsor. Uh, Amazon Prime Video because they understand the importance of having their online, uh, having a physical uh, presence along with their online brand. So uh, uh, Amazon also came into a project we did with Westfield and Century City as well. So you know I, I think the online online retailers are beginning to understand the um, the, the value in having a physical presence as well. And um, maybe maybe just to you, Herman. I mean. Uh, Amazon Go looking to open, or reportedly looking to open, 3,000 stores, um, roll that out. Um, is that kind of ultra convenience? Is that competing with the convenience store market? Um, or is it really a sign that, that Amazon are also looking at going in, in scale into physical stores? I, I think both. I mean, you know, if Amazon decides to open uh, 3,000 uh, convenience stores, uh, regardless their technical equipment, how the process works, of course people can spend the money only once and they will only buy a specific amount of uh, convenience. So obviously uh, that's competition in the convenience sector. On the other hand also, Amazon go going physical, what are they going to do with those stores? In what sense are those stores going to play a role in their total retail and delivery system? Those stores can probably handle much more than just convenience. They can also handle service points. They can handle return points. It can be a delivery point. It can actually become a kind of meeting place where Amazon can meet its clients in their catchment areas. And if they do that very strategically, of course, they can get much more out of those, uh, out of those stores. I'm, I'm excited to see you know, how that's going to work out. And I think also it's a major step also in the convenience sector for, for further information like uh, frictionless shopping, like you know, uh, check out free stores, uh, automatic payments, etc. I mean, Amazon, of course, very advanced, but, but in, in Europe, like, like Ahold in the Netherlands and, and, and some other brands are, are very active in, uh, in really lowering the barrier to do shopping. Obviously, lots of shopping centers have been designed with huge amounts of parking. Um, so picking up Marie's point that millennials aren't driving, and certainly I know that from my children, is that they haven't bothered to learn. Admittedly, I live in London, whereas when I grew up, I lived right in the middle of the country, and if I hadn't have, if I hadn't have had a car, I would have never got anywhere. Um, but what's your, what's your sense of that? We talked about them being more urban and that, that responding to a growing need. What happens to shopping centres then that aren't near that? How important is it for them to be near transport hubs? Um, what, what's your sense of that? And will there be a reconversion of some of that space into alternative use, perhaps, if, if we don't need the car parks? Or will we still need car, <laughs> because it'll be still automatic cars dropping people off? How much thought has gone into that from your side? Well, I think that uh, the amount of parking is going to, to be re gradually reducing, going down, uh, replaced by alternatives of public transport, but as well with the appearance of driveless cars uh, used in a collaborative way. They are already announced to start to run around London in 2020, in Japan with the Olympic Games in 2020, that will quickly uh, be assumed all around the world and will be a total revolution for retail. Because if you consider that a brand new shopping center that has all parking underground, uh, the, the capex, the 50% of the capex is consumed by that underground parking. If we can find a way to substitute that by other means, by sure we're going to do it. So the thing now is for, for developers that are planning to do brand new shopping centers is how many parking spaces to build and in what kind, because the underground parking, I think, has a very short future. 
uh, and probably the strategy now is to do parkies on surface, on, on the deck buildings, uh, with proper height to be converted into other uses in five to ten years. Um, I was reading the other day a news in the US. Uh, you know, in the US it's very common this strategy of the park and ride, and all around cities you have that parking buildings. And there is a national plan now that is considering the arrival of the driveless cars to convert that buildings into social housing because nobody is going to leave a car in, 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 in those buildings. So that's, that's a sign of something that the retail sector needs to attend. I think by the moment nobody is capable to take a decision about it. We have some clients already sinking. Uh, that transforms as well the design of the, sh of the shopping centers because a lot of people will, will arrive by shared driveless cars and we need to have a lot larger drop-off areas. So the future shopping centers will work more similar to an airport or to a train station. Uh, so yes, it's a total change and it's a trend going forward. Okay, good. Um, and obviously, Sebastian, um, at the moment, presumably um, access, transport access, very important for your centres. How are you thinking about that, that for the future? Um, so just pick up that point. But also, I'd like to just learn a little bit more about what you're seeing in terms of the brands. Um, are there new brands coming into the market um, that you're seeing? And also, um, do you, do you think that the lifetime of, of brands, whether that's F&B, um, is getting shorter? What, what, what's your sense of that? Well, coming back to Jorge's point, uh, probably out of those roughly 200 outlets which are in Europe, I guess that probably 80% of them are far away from any urban uh, destination. We should be scared as hell. Um, but let me just become, before I ask a sec answer your second question, let me come back to that point on convenience. And I think that's something which maybe uh, I also have to make clear that actually uh, we see, and then we see actually that only in very few urban locations, convenience plays a factor in outlet business. Um, because we are actually, footprint is too small. Um, there are better and more urban locations to actually provide the day-to-day -day convenience. Um, so what we actually see as a future, and you see it in some of our assets, uh, some the new one in Amsterdam, one in, in France, where we have actually, where we're actually not even thinking so much about the retail footprint, but actually as a different value proposition in hospitality. So actually, we actually cater more for the consumer who may have put her time into a theater trip for four hours and rather go and visit us for four hours and buy the way they shop. And that's the way we need to set it up because we're not having any aim on competing on competition. I think that's what outlets, or hardly any outlet, is really capable of doing. Um, that's why we're also very picky on brands and we also, the brands are more uh, reserved um, on long-term leases, but that's very fine for us uh, because we see that actually flexibility in our model is absolutely key. Uh, we are currently working with three to five year leases. Again, not so easy when you go to the lenders, but that's actually the name of game. It may in the end uh, land up in that sort of six months pop-up rollover structure. That may be really a case, um, but I think that's 10 years from now, we work on two, three year contracts, very quick asset management moves. And if you look at um, around what business is doing today, we're, we're rolling about 10 to 15% of our um, tenants around every year. Okay, uh, good. Um, Maria, I just wanted to pick up with you, the, the, when we're looking at locations, um, what are the things that are coming through in your research about um, the locations that the developers are looking at, that the investors are looking at? Where do people want to be? Uh, it, it really all depends on who it is you're talking to and the, you know, from a brand perspective, occupier perspective, it, it's such a huge variety of answers. I think on the convenience point, and I know, you know, in big urban cities, probably there will be less demand for parking. You go out to a smaller city, the retailers, the brands, they want sites with parking at this point in time. And I think that will continue over the short to medium term. Um, 
so it, it really depends. I think in terms of if you are a, let's just pick fashion, for example, um, so, you know, a mass market premium fashion brand, you're probably concentrating your efforts on sort of key gateway cities globally. Um, and the reality is you're reducing your footprint to a number of key stores or even a single store in that city dependent on how large that city is but going back to the point around flexibility because I think that's the real issue in terms of delivering sort of live-in retail locations is the valuation point and how you can deliver a really attractive destination where you have that revolving mix of offer while maintaining the valuation um, because unfortunately the way particularly in you know it's a European UK issue I'm, I'm sure it might be the case in the US um, you know banks like really long leases they don't really exist anymore and I think from a landlord perspective to keep those locations attractive to the consumer they need that variety and also what's really exciting in terms of the Middle East you know the le how the leisure is operated there's you know profit sharing for example um, is probably more common, whereas, you know, UK, Europe, it's, okay, 25-year lease, you have to pay a rent. Well, actually, for it to really be a success, both parties have to be fully engaged in that process. Well, that's interesting. Do you want to pick that up, Shane? Is that, how are you operating that? Well, you, uh, you said it quite correctly, because uh, the way that we've approached um, particularly the, uh, the key unique leisure offer is actually a build-to-suit lease arrangement uh, under which they actually consult and approve uh, each stage of the development and each milestone. But ultimately, um, it's, we're, we're both quite involved in it. We're both uh, setting the vision, and then, of course, in a build-to-suit with a yield with, uh, you're correct, there's a, there's a profit share at the back end of it. So we're very excited about that, and, um, and, we're, and I think that's probably, there's a bit of an uh, evolution of rent taking place in, in our business, and I think you're going to see a greater reliance upon uh, that variable uh, factor coming out there. I guess biggest challenges um, that you see at the moment in terms of the trends when you're, when you're looking forward. Um, this can be anybody, there's no order to it, so what are the biggest challenges that people are seeing? Come on. <laughs> We're talking a lot about flexibility. But I think, you know, the challenge is to find a balance between, let's say, resilient concepts which can survive the cycle and which are, let's say, trend-proof, which at the same time, inside the concept, offer enough flexibility to accommodate the change. To put an example, the very first shopping center in the U.S. modern shopping center was, I believe, Country Club Plaza in Kansas City, and it's still a success. Um, I, I would say one of the biggest challenges facing us is obviously coming from e-commerce. And I think one of the, uh, a lot of people talk about price and uh, the convenience and uh, these factors. I think a lot of the advantage comes from data. Uh, your digital footprint is a mile wide, and when you log into one of these websites, they know everything about you. They're able to push offers and uh, do a very precise marketing campaign against you. So we've got a, a, a very large focus on the collection of walk-in data, and we really want to break down that wall and uh, give our retailers uh, the same level of information that, uh, that the online retailers get when they're there. Now, I'm not sure whether this is, would be in Europe, but certainly in our area, we're working with the telecoms and with the uh, search engines and with the social medias uh, to create a very, very strong profile using geofencing of who's inside the shopping center minute by minute, day by day, and we're able to compare that with uh, the rest of the market to provide us with the, the opportunity to do some collaborative marketing platforms where we actually invite the retailers to come in and, and do targeted marketing with us. Okay, good. Anybody else? Yep, I think it's quite simple. Um, I think if anybody would have a clear understanding about the consumer habit in 2030, will be a very fortunate man. Um, Has anybody so, got any? <laughs> so um, we always we have a lot of discussion about disruption, and uh, very often the, the, the talk on disruption goes into a tech sort of area. And actually, um, I've been actually at one of conferences recently, and uh, I was one smart person actually. Disruption is just somebody giving a better service. And that's quite true. And the only question is how far can you push service and keep it at a human approachable and engaged scale? So of course now we see room, but everybody will evolve in that direction. In hospitality we get more, and it doesn't matter if there's a discount 
a second line of communication or not. So what's next in five or 10 or 15 years from now? That's the challenge, we don't know. We just have to be as prepared as possible. And that's interesting, because one of the, the, the key things that came out of when I was looking at the Selfridges thing was that up until that point, um, people had said, you know, they would say, oh, are you just browsing? Um, and if you said yes, they would ask you to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so, and I kind of remembered that. Also, partly in, in the, you know, in the 70s, it was a bit like that. You know, why are you in the shop? <laughs> um, so I think that's, that is an interesting point about disruption being about service. You know, when you think about WeWork, when you think about Uber, when you think about those, it's actually changed the service model um, in a way. Um, two minutes left, so um, we can all work out the time in between us. There's six of you. Um, so um, let's let's. Just give me your, the thing that you think is going to be the most influential trend um, for retail. You can choose the timeline. You can go to 2050 if you like, Jorge. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's, start, let's, let's start with you, Grant. What do you think the biggest trend is going to be? Well, <clears throat> we're, we're dealing more with the retail environment, the shopping center itself. And I think uh, how can we continue to in increase the engagement factor with our customers without overthinking it. Uh, I, I think there's a tendency sometimes to not really understand that our customers, yes, they're young families, but they're also children. And so kids still want to jump, run, climb, slide, you know, those type of things. So I think sometimes there's a natural tendency for adults to overthink this uh, in terms of all kinds of technology and that type of stuff. So, uh, you know, how do we still uh, continue to reinvent ourselves, but without overthinking what the offering needs, needs to look like? Because kids are still kids everywhere in the world. Okay, good. Okay. Well, I think one of the problems we have now is that we split retail into two worlds. Now, the physical retail and the e-commerce, we are still in the process to, to put the two together. And that's one of the main trends, uh, because this partition is affecting both sides. So that needs to be sorted together with uh, coming back to city center into more human cities with more greenery, more open space. So all, that's the main trend in, Shen, in total. OK, also. good. Herman. Well, linking also to that, I think we have seen uh, retail. I think we are getting used to the fact that retail now is really becoming truly multi-channel. And retail operations, physical stores, and uh, online strategies are fully integrated. I think for the trend for the coming year, many trends, but I think a very important one, artificial intelligence, and how that's going to influence both offline physical stores and online selling. Okay, good. Sebastian. I actually like Grant's point because uh, we should be quite careful not overthinking and over, let's say, progressing that engagement to uh, human people. Um, so I had to find a different point. <laughs> and uh, um, one quite interesting observation, we didn't discuss it actually, is um, already brands today are going from a product and price-centric approach to a, to a consumer-centric approach. And I wouldn't be surprised in 10, 15 years from now, actually any development, any uh, outlet, shopping mall, is actually consumer centric um, And not just by consultants, but actually consumer-driven input and decisions. And that's going to be completely changing the way we build and the way we operate. OK, good. Marie? Uh, I think tech-driven leisure concepts um, and those coming into retail locations, so eSports, VR, leisure concepts. I mean, if you look at something we do or I do is look at PE funding and there is an increasing amount of funding going into esports operators, developers. And if you look at China, um, there's some really exciting concepts focused around that. And I think we'll start to see them appear elsewhere around the world. Okay, good. Shane. I'm going to give you two, because I'm going to give you the one that I think will happen and the one I wish would happen. So the first one, I think, um, personally, I think it's uh, right now we're talking about e-commerce, we're starting to talk about m-commerce, we're talking about uh, v-commerce, which is the voice-activated uh, voice commerce, and VR commerce is apparently about five years away. I think that's actually just going to all boil down to commerce, and everybody will be everywhere. It'll be an omni-channel world. I think uh, landlords need to start preparing for the fact that they need to be able to fulfill from uh, the stores and uh, provide the last 
my logistics uh, facilities within them. Now, what I wish would happen is socially conscious. I really wish uh, that uh, the, we would, and, and we are seeing this to some extent, the millennials are extremely uh, picky about how, who they choose to do business with based on uh, whether that particular retailer has a social conscience, whether they're paying attention to the triple bottom line, and I hope to see that continue.